Okay, so, so the question is, how about grieving the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible mean when it says grieve, grieving the Holy Spirit? Okay, if, if you find Ephesians 4, verse 30, uh, and we'll actually look at the actual verse <coughs> in question... And what we'll do, I'll read it first, all right, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And it's Paul writing to the Christians in the Ephesian church, and he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, in order to understand what grieving the Holy Spirit means... We've got to look at the context in which Paul is saying it. And therefore, what I'm going to do is we'll read back from verse 22. And we'll read the whole section. Okay? And, and of course, sort of part of, of the work of Bible teaching isn't just so that you learn what the Bible says. But it, it's to learn how to interpret the Bible. Do you see what I mean? Because you're not going to have a situation where, in your lifetime, you sit under a Bible teacher who explains every verse of the Bible. It's just not going to happen. But what you can do is learn the principles of interpreting verses so that you can work them out for yourself. And one of the most important, any verse in the Bible, is in a context. And it's by looking at the context in which that verse is that you get an idea what it's talking about. It's like, for instance, uh, somebody might say, oh, grieving the Holy Spirit. That means that if the Lord wants you to speak out loud in a tongue or interpret a tongue in a meeting, if you don't do it, then you're grieving the Holy Spirit. And everyone thinks, oh, yes, of course, that's what it means. But it doesn't mean that at all, because we're going to see that these verses have got nothing to do with that whatsoever. I mean, the Holy Spirit isn't happy. I mean, he likes it that when he moves through us, we respond. But to understand precisely what any verse of the Bible means, you've got to look at it in context. So let's start from verse 22, all right? And then we'll do a a, a quick shifty right through Ephesians to give you the whole context. That'll only be a quickie, and we can put the whole thing together. So verse 22, Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new nature, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbour. For we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now let me immediately, that verse there, it's give no place to the devil. And that word that's translated here, opportunity, in the Greek is topos. Now you get the word topography, how the land lies, okay? The topographical features of of the earth. That's the word, give no place to the devil to the devil, i.e. don't let the devil in to your bit of land, don't let the devil get into you, alright? Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour doing honest work with his hands, so that he may be able to give to those in need. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for edifying as fits the occasion, that it may impart grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now, what we see in Ephesians is a classic example of the way that Paul writes. 
And the very way that he writes speaks to us something about the truth of God that he's seeking to communicate. Because what he does, if you were to read Ephesians 1 and 2, we're not going to, all right? But if you were to read it, you'll find that what Paul does there is that he launches in and he says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, etc., etc. And Paul then lists out and praises God and explains everything that Jesus has done for us. And remember that as Christians, when we're talking about everything that Jesus has done for us, that's another way of saying everything that is now true of us because of Jesus. It wasn't true once, but it is now because of Jesus. And in Ephesians, basically, what Paul goes through, and I'm just going to pick out sort of key bits, I can't go into the whole lot, but basically what he's saying is, look, God had a plan. And God's plan finally was us, the church, people who are saved. And that what God has done through Jesus is that he has taken us and he's put us in Jesus. Now, when Jesus came and lived and died and rose again, Jesus beat everything that was going. Whatever he faced, he beat it. Absolutely defeated. Everything that Satan did, everything that sin has ever done. Jesus beat it. He took it on, an eyeball job, and he beat it. All right? Now then, the result of that is that because Jesus has now done that, he is now back in heaven with his Father, where he started off, because Jesus is God. But there's a big difference now, and the difference is this. Before the second person of the Trinity came down to earth in human form, he wasn't a man. He was God. He was the second person of the Trinity. But he wasn't a man. All right. The difference now is that Jesus has gone back to heaven, which was where he started off, but he's still a man. Can you see? So that Jesus, or the second person of the Trinity, became a man. He wasn't a man, but he became a man because man was the problem. And now he's beaten the problem in man and he's ascended back into heaven. And he has done that as a man. Jesus is still human. He never stopped being God. He always was God. But God became a man. And as I've often said, if God does something, he does it properly. Therefore, Jesus became a real, solid, flesh and blood man. And he beat everything that has beaten man. He dealt with sin completely, and he's ascended back into heaven as a man. Now, what that means is this. At this precise moment, there's a man in heaven. And there's a man standing at the right hand of God. There is a man who now holds the highest place in the universe. Because God became a man. Now, because a man is in heaven, because Jesus is a man, he went there as a forerunner. And because Jesus can be in heaven, we can be in heaven. One man got through, therefore the rest can follow. All right. Any man or woman can end up in heaven. Now, the essence of the gospel is God wants to share. Everything he has and is, he wants to share. Now, Jesus has been placed in heaven now, and he's far above all rule and authority. All right? Jesus is the final authority in the universe. Everything is subject to his will. Everything is subject to his power. Nothing is going to go wrong. Because Jesus, now, as a man, is completely in charge of the whole caboodle, the whole of creation. He was before he came a man, but he still is, but now he's a man. Okay. Now, the essence of God is that he wants to share, and that what God has done, he has shared that rule and authority that Jesus has with us, that we share with that in Jesus, that we have the same authority of Jesus because we have been made one with him. The moment you were born again, you became one with Jesus. Therefore, Jesus' experience, Jesus' history, Jesus' nature has now been shared with you. You were one with him. All right? Jesus has died to sin. You shared in that. You died to sin as well. 
Jesus is raised above all rule and authority. You are raised above all rule and authority. Because when you were made one with Jesus, when you were born again, you came into a sharing of everything that Jesus is and everything that Jesus has. Therefore, Jesus is in charge. Everything is under his authority. Which means that Satan and all power on the earth is subject to him. Now, we're raised up with Jesus in heavenly places. Therefore, Satan and every situation on this earth is also subject to us. All right. So, because we've been made one with Jesus, we have freedom from sin. We have authority over every situation that we encounter because Jesus has freedom from sin and because Jesus has authority over every situation he encounters. Now, that is what that is the truth. That is what God has accomplished in us. All right? That is the truth now of you. Now, in Philippians, Paul puts it like this. He says, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. Now what Paul now proceeds to do is he says, look, that is now the truth about you. That is what God has worked into you. Now, through your obedience and following the Lord day to day and living in submission to his word, you must work out what that truth has worked in. Can you see what I mean? You have got to let out. You have got to bring out. You have got to allow to come out everything that is true of what God has put inside you. And finally, what you have inside of you is the life of Jesus himself. So what Paul has done here in Ephesians, he has outlined broadly everything that Jesus has done for us, everything that is true of us. Now what he then goes on to do is to say, right, okay, but you've probably noticed, he says, that it doesn't seem very true of you. That's the theory, but is it what's working out in practice? And the answer is probably no. Now the whole point is this. Paul now moves on in the letter And he says, this is now what you've got to do in order to allow what is true of you to be worked out in your life and experience. So what Paul's saying is you've got the whole package because of what Jesus has done. Everything you need, you've got. But now you've got to work it out. You've got to allow it to come out and be your experience. Now then, therefore, that brings us to verse 22. And notice now what Paul says. He says this, Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now let's recap. What Paul has said so far in Ephesians and in every book he ever wrote, every letter he, and every book in the Bible says this. What it says basically is this. The moment that you were born again, you were made one with Jesus and you shared his experience. Jesus' experience is that he died to sin once and for all. He lived and he overcame it, then he died to it. He actually became sin itself. He dealt with it totally and thoroughly. Now then, if Jesus is dead to sin and lives to it no longer, because Jesus now lives in the power of God, if Jesus died to sin and the power of sin once and for all, Then what happened to you the minute you believed? You died to sin and the power of sin. Alright? Now, what Paul is saying, that when you were converted, and he talks about in Romans being baptised, and of course we know that the gospel is repent and be baptised, that when we're baptised and go down into the waters, But what we're doing is we are acting out our identification with Jesus 
in his death. All right. So we're saying that we have died to sin. Now, in Romans, Paul builds on this in Romans 6, and he says, look, he said, you've died to sin. All right, if you turn to Romans 6, let's actually read the words. Because you find in the epistles of Paul that there are parallel passages, you see. And if you compare each parallel passage from each letter, it becomes clear. Romans chapter 6. And I'll start reading from verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So there you have it. When we were converted, we died to sin. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus, and remember, you were baptised into Christ Jesus, not at your water baptism, that happened when you were born again. You get baptised in water as an outward symbol of what happened when you were born again. Baptise means to dip. Baptise means to put into. And as soon as you were converted, you were put into Jesus. All right. So he says, do you not know that all of us have been baptised into Christ Jesus, were baptised into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now then, go down into verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that our sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Now there it is. You see, our problem as sinners is that we've got a sin nature. Our problem is that no matter what you do, you're under the power of sin. You can't improve yourself because the very idea of improving yourself is sinful, all right? Because <laughs> holiness is a free gift from God. It's by grace. Therefore, the moment you try and improve yourself, you are trying to attain to holiness in your own strength, which is a sin, all right? Only Jesus is holy. Only God is holy. So we're stuck. We are completely and totally under the power of sin. So let me put it like this. You... Your problem is that you've got a sin nature inside of you. Now, one of the things that you've often heard me say here is that you're not the problem. It's your sin nature that's the problem. There's nothing wrong with you except your sin. But boy, your sin is a real problem, you see. Because you were born with a sinful nature. So how can I say it? Before I became a Christian, I was the sin nature BJ. I was the sin nature version of BJ. Alright? God created me and there was nothing wrong with me at all. I'm in the image of God. But my problem is that I've got a sin nature which can do nothing but stand against God and go against his commandments. And that sin nature, it's, it permeates every aspect of me, BJ, and twists me. So it controls me. Alright? Now then, what happens, Paul's saying here, is that the moment you're born again and baptised or put into Christ, you share Jesus' death. And Jesus' death was a death to sin. Now what happens is this. The moment you're born again, your sin nature is destroyed. And it was destroyed on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. Now then, I've got to go into a little bit of Greek here. Because if we left it there, I've told you that if your sin nature is destroyed, it's not a problem anymore. And yet all of us know that that isn't true, don't we? All of us know, no matter how long we've been converted, that whereas the Bible says that our sin nature was destroyed the moment that we got converted, somehow it still seems to be hanging around a long time hence, doesn't it? <laughs> now the important thing to realise is that this word here, destroyed, it doesn't mean annihilated. All right. The Greek word is katagio, and it means to bring to nothing. It means to render useless, to render inoperative. Or the best word I like is neutralize. All right. 
Now then, when Jesus died on the cross, and when you were put into Jesus, hence sharing his experience, past, present and future, your sin nature was completely neutralised by the cross of Jesus. Now then, say you've got a bottle of acid, alright? Now that represents your sin nature, alright? And that it stings, doesn't it? Acid does a lot of damage. It does harm. That describes our, our sin natures. As soon as we get together, as soon as you get sinners together, they sting, don't they? They sting each other. We sting each other. It's a lovely picture of the sinful nature. And acid eats everything away. And as I say, we're okay. We're created in the image of God. But our sin natures eat us away and it twists us. Everything comes out wrong. distorts us as people. Now then, there you've got that acid. Now, how do you deal with that? Right, you neutralise it. Now, let's hear we've got some alkaline. Now, what happens when you pour the alkaline into the acid? The acid is neutralised. It doesn't work as acid. It is no longer active. It is catagioed. And that is precisely the word that Paul here uses in Romans 6. He's saying that the alkaline of Jesus' death on the cross, and you being one with Jesus now, that neutralises your sin nature, so it's no longer active. However, here is not the catch, but here is the reality of it, and it's this. Say you've got this bottle of what was once acid, and it's been neutralised by the alkaline, and it's harmless. There's no more sting in it. If you remove the alkaline, if you remove the neutraliser, the acid is there the same as it ever was. Now the point is this. The truth of the Christian life is that you were converted or justified, all right, forgiven, set free from the penalty of sin by receiving Jesus by faith. All you did is you believed that Jesus has saved you, didn't you? You said, thank you, Lord, for saving me. You responded to what Jesus had already done. So you believed that what the Bible said was true. You believed that Jesus died on the cross to deal with your sins. And because you believed it, you received his new life. And therefore you were set free from the penalty of sin. So that you never needed worry about the lake of fire again. Because that's the penalty of sin. However, that's justification. The initial getting right with God. All right. But sanctification is the process whereby God then works in us to set us free, not from the penalty of sin, because that's already been done when you got converted, but to set us free from the power of sin, or the power that our sin nature has over us. Now the problem is that what happens is that Christians, they get saved by faith. And then they get stuck into getting sanctified and work really hard for it. <laughs> you see. And that is where the mistake lies. Because the truth is that everything we receive from God is by faith. Everything we receive from God is simply that you realise that you've already been given it in Jesus. Again, let me just read a couple of verses from Ephesians. Skip back to Ephesians and just from chapter 1. When Paul says this. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now what that means is that when you were converted, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places was given to you in Jesus. You got the lot when you were converted. All right, everything you needed you received when you were converted because you received Jesus himself. And everything that God has is in Jesus. In him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So, the point is that then, if you've got everything that you need already, can you see that it's then simply a question of realising that you've already got everything you need and acting on it? It's faith. And when you act on it, when you believe it, then you move in it and it becomes true. When you realise that every spiritual need has been met in Jesus, then you stop trying to get your needs met 
and you realise, hey, they are met in Jesus, and you simply live as if they are, and then according to your faith be it unto you. Mm -hmm. So can you see that sanctification, again, is simply receiving in faith? Now then, the point is this, that we've got the sin nature neutralised by the um, by the cross, all right? So that the alkaline was has been poured onto our sin nature. The moment you were converted, the death of Jesus and now the life of Jesus neutralizes your sinful nature. But here's the point. In John 15, Jesus speaks about abiding in him. Now, if we abide in Jesus, if we simply move in faith, staying close to Jesus, knowing that everything that we need has already been done for us, then to the extent that you're abiding in Jesus, the alkaline is on the acid, and the acid is not effective. But the moment that you get separated from Jesus, the moment you stop abiding in Jesus, the alkaline is removed and the acid is active again. Can you see what I'm saying? That our sinful nature is only rendered inoperative to the extent that we are abiding in Jesus and believing and being in faith that he has overcome our sinful nature. Can you see what I mean? By faith we're literally attaching ourselves or making experiential our oneness with Jesus. But if we don't believe what Jesus has done, we separate ourselves from him and we stop abiding. Move on to verse 12, all right? Um, this is in, in Romans 6. No, sorry, verse 11. And Paul says this, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now that word consider is reckon. It's an accounting term. You've heard of a ready reckoner, haven't you? And it means, the word, I mean it's an accounting term. If you go into the bank and pay £50 in, then you can reckon on that £50 being in your account. What that means is because you know it's there, you reckon on it and you use it, you draw on it. But if somehow you pay the money in and then forget it's there, you're not going to draw on it. Can you see what I mean? So what Paul is saying, he says, look, reckon yourselves, consider yourselves, believe that you are dead to sin because of the alkaline action of the cross on your sinful nature believe that Jesus has overcome the power of sin in your life and to that extent that you're believing that and receiving that from the Lord in faith to that extent the power of sin in your life will be overcome but if you get separated if, if you're, you're not close to Jesus for whatever reason then the moment you're not abiding in him the alkaline has gone and the acid is there in absolutely full measure so can you see what I mean? that the answer to overcoming the power of sin, well, in fact, it's not. We cannot overcome. We cannot conquer our sin. But what we can do is if we let Jesus conquer us, if we simply abide in Jesus, knowing that he is the one who deals with the power of sin in our lives. So then, what we've seen is that the moment you were converted, the power of God in your life has neutralized your sinful nature, but only to the extent that you remain faithful to Jesus and close to him. If you abide in Jesus, then the power of God over your sin will be manifest. But if you don't abide in Jesus for whatever reason, to that extent you'll find that your sin nature is totally in control of you. Either God is in control of your sin nature by neutralizing it with you abiding in Jesus, or your sin nature is in control of you. There are no half ways on that. Also, what you can find as well is that as God deals with you, and remember that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, or part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is to bring this into experience in our own lives. Now remember, if freedom from the power of sin is simply by believing that Jesus has already won it for us, then you won't try and do anything. You'll simply receive it as a free gift. But if you try and do it in your own strength, 
that is denying that Jesus has done it for you. You're saying, no, Lord, this is what I do, when the truth is it's something that he has done. So the point is, if you struggle in your own efforts to overcome sin, you'll be beaten, because your own efforts are half the problem. All right, But the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring you to the end of yourself in certain areas of your life. Because maybe after you've tried, and I mean part of the problem with our sin nature is that we like to feel in charge. You know, you know we, we like to feel nice and responsible for our lives. I mean, we've got to be responsible in one way, but we like to accomplish things. All right. So if in a certain area of your life you're really determined on a bit of self-improvement, all right, then the law will let you do that. But what will happen is that when you've been working on that for ten years, and when you have eventually, after 10 years of constant failure, when eventually you've clicked that you're never going to do it, <coughs> you'll stop trying, won't you? <coughs> when you've clicked that there's no way that you can do it, then maybe you can set the Holy Spirit free to do it for you. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to the end of our own efforts, the end of our own strugglings, simply to realise that it's what Jesus does through us. It's not coming from, the power of this is not sourced in what we do for the Lord. The power of it is sourced in Jesus and by abiding in him. As Jesus said, he's the vine and we're the branches. If the branch simply sits on the vine and let the vine do the work, then it will produce the fruit. Mm. But I mean, if you've got a vine, try a branch trying ever so hard to produce fruit, you've got a vine that there's something very wrong with. You see, because a vine that realizes it's part a branch that realizes it's part of the vine isn't rushing around trying to produce fruit. It just produces fruit because it can't help it. It's part of the vine. That's how it works. It draws its life from the vine itself. So then, thus far, we've got this. When you were born again, when you were joined to Jesus. Your old sin nature, the sinful BJ version in my, in, in, for me, and, and the sinful you version, all right, that died, potentially died, so that to the extent that you abide in Jesus, the death of Jesus overcomes and renders that sinful nature inactive. But it's more than that. Remember, when Adam and Eve were walking on a perfect earth, they were in perfect fellowship with God. There was nothing between them and the Lord whatsoever. They were perfect people. They really were terrific, created in the image of God. But they sinned, and they got their sin natures, didn't they? And that's what caused the problem. Now, it's not enough to just get rid of the sin nature. That's just a negative thing, and the gospel is a positive thing. Because what we're going to see now is that having dealt also with our old sin nature, or the sin version, the BJ, as I, I tend to call it, not only that, but you were born again. Now, being born again means lots and lots of things, but one of the things it does mean is that a new Jesus version BJ was born in me when I was born again. Not only was the potential there for the old nature to be neutralised, but a new nature was born in me and born in you. And that nature born in you was this. It's the you that you would have been if you'd never sinned. It's the you that you'd have been if sin had never come into the world. Can you see what I'm saying? So it's not just enough to get rid of the old nature, we need a new nature as well. Now then, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. And back to verse 22. And we can see now what Paul is saying. He says, put off your old nature which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt or decayed through deceitful lusts. So here, Paul is reminding, he says, look, your old sin nature has been dealt with. Put it off. He says you don't need to obey it. You don't need to be in its power. Not because you've got any strength to overcome it. You haven't. But he says because Jesus has overcome it. And if you believe it and act on that, 
If you just receive that from the Lord and say, Lord, yeah, that's true, I believe what you've done, then to that extent you're abiding in Jesus and the death of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit neutralizes that sinful nature. So Paul is saying, put it off. You do not have to live under its power because Jesus has set you free from its power. But he goes on, and look what he says now. He says, not just enough to put off the old nature, he says, but be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new nature, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, can you see that? It's not just that your old nature, when you were born again, was dealt with. It's that when you were born again, a new you, Jesus version, was born inside of you. <coughs> now, the point is this. It's up to us which nature we live in. Can you see what I mean? I mean, I'm not sort of trying to say that there's more than one you. Obviously, you are you. But the point is, where are you going to be sourced from? Are we going to live out of our old nature? Or are we going to live out of our new nature created after the righteousness of and the holiness of God. Turn over to Colossians and you'll see the parallel passage where Paul deals with this. Find Colossians 3 and verse 9. Before I read it, just note that in the Ephesians passage, we're going to, get, we're going to work down in a few minutes. He says, therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbour. All right, now notice that. And then in Colossians, notice this. Uh, Colossians 3 and what verse nine. did I say? Verse 9. Do not lie to one another. You're going to see that there's an ethical application here that we're going to look at in a minute. Do not lie to each other. Now listen to this. Seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices. Why had they put it off? Well, because they don't need to keep it on. Jesus died to deal with that sinful nature in them. And if they believe that, if they abide in Jesus in faith and obedience to him, then they'll experience that power of God to neutralize their sinful natures. So he says, put... Um, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices. But does it end there with the destruction of the old? No, it doesn't. Listen to this. He says, and have put on the new nature. Can you see that? It's not just that the old nature that, that made you sin all the time has been dealt with, but you've got a new nature inside of you. And this new nature, what does it say? Which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Who is the creator? Jesus is. Can you see, a, a Jesus version of you was born in you the moment you were born again. That's what being born again means. Corinthians, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, the new has come, the old has passed away. But it's up to us which we live in. Do we live in the new or do we live in the old? Now bearing that in mind, go over to the first epistle of John. I want to show you a few verses which puzzled people, but now you've got the answer to understanding them. And if you go to chapter 5 and verse 18. Now, as John writes this letter, and remember it was John who in his gospel recorded mainly the teaching that Jesus gave about being born again, all right? And that in the letter, John, he talks about this, you know, saying that, that, that they have been born again. You know, not of the will of man, but the will of God, all right? Now then, um, I'm just going to read chapter 3 and verse 9. You keep your finger in where I've given it to you. No one born of God commits sin. No one born of God commits sin. Wait a minute, chapter 3. Alright, chapter 3, verse 9. 
all right? No one born of God commits sin. For God's nature abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Sorry, this is 1 John, isn't it? 1 John, chapter 3 and verse 9. I'll read it again. No one born of God commits sin. For God's nature abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now flick over into chapter 5, verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not sin, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now here we've got statements in the epistle of John which puzzle people. Because John is saying that if you've been born ago, uh, if if you've been born again, you do not sin. He who is born of God, in fact, it's more than that. He says you cannot sin, and yet it is John's epistle as well, in um, in chapter one verse eight, where he says, "If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us." Now here we have one of these sort of contradictions. On the one hand John is saying if you're born of God you cannot sin and yet on the other hand he's saying but if you say you haven't got any sin you're deceiving yourself and the truth isn't in you. Now what's he talking about? Right I'll tell you he's talking about this. You see when you were born again the Jesus version the new nature that you received and remember it's the nature of you or me created directly after the image of Jesus but sharing everything that Jesus is, as, is and has and one of the things that Jesus has as the Son of God is sinlessness and what it means is this that new nature in you cannot sin that new nature you received is totally 100% sinless why? well why is it we sin? Because the sinful nature was passed on through Adam. I got a sinful nature in the first place because my father passed it on to me. My children will receive a sinful nature because I passed mine on to them. But when you got born again, what happened? You were born not of the will of man, but of the Spirit. And God became your father. And when you were born again, I of myself, my sin nature can do nothing but sin because that's what I inherited from my father. He was a sinner as well. But now my father is in heaven and he is sinless. Therefore, like father, like son, the nature I receive from him cannot sin. All right. But why is it that John says, also, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves? It's for this reason that John knew full well that as long as we've got this body, and remember one day you're going to get a resurrection body, and I'll tell you some nice things about that in a minute, but as long as you've got this body, your sinful nature is always there inside of you, waiting to strike the moment that you stop abiding in Jesus. One of the holiness doctrines that has gone round in the history of the church you know this idea that people say that you can get to the point where you're totally free from sin sinless perfection as they call it the error of that is that they don't do their greek properly and in that romans 6 that i read you they get to the bit the body of death you know the sinful nature has been destroyed and they say there it is it's gone Whereas I've shown you that the Greek word doesn't mean annihilated, no longer there, but neutralized, mm. if you use the neutralizer. Mm. So, use the neutralizer, it's neutralized, but if you don't, it isn't. Now, John knew that there are going to be times, no matter how close you are to Jesus, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how mature you are, there are going to be times when you're not using that neutralizer, can you see? So that any, at any time, can fall into sin. So it's not a question of saying that the sinful nature is no longer there. It is there, 
And the moment you stop abiding in Jesus, that sinful nature will strike, and that's all that's going to come out of you. But the point is, to the extent that you abide in Jesus, then the new nature can be coming out of you as well. And that nature, the you, as we grow in the Lord, is that this isn't a kind of either you're totally abiding and therefore totally free, or totally not abiding and totally in sin. The Holy Spirit is working through you as a complete person. All right. Picture your life as having lots of doors, like a house, lots of rooms. And the Holy Spirit is going around each room in the order that he chooses all right, to clean it out. Now the point is, in one part of your life, you could have been what I would call substantially dealt with or substantially sorted out. And however God's done it, he's brought you to the point of absolute helplessness and submission to him, all right? Whereby, in that area of your life, you are substantially living in victory. Because you're not energising yourself. You're simply receiving from Jesus in faith and obedience. Therefore, you're experiencing the victory of Jesus over sin in a particular area of your life. So in that part of your life, the new nature is shining through. Whereas another bit of your life is still the old nature. Can you see what I mean? And the Holy Spirit's moving on. And I mean, if you're living in great victory in a part of your life where once you're in total defeat, I mean, obviously, praise the Lord for that and testify of that. But don't get proud of that, because what about the other bits of your life where you're not in victory yet, but still in defeat? Can you see it's an ongoing thing? And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to be applying this to us throughout our lives. That's why when Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, not that I have attained, or I'm already perfect. That word perfect means mature. He says, but I press on. He says, there's more to come even for me. There's, uh, you know, he's saying that, that there's still too much Paul the Apostle and not enough Jesus. And however close we are to the Lord, there's still too much of our old nature and not enough of the new nature that's coming through. So that's what the, the whole sanctifying process is, this being set free from the power of sin. So then, therefore, from what I've said thus far, there's a very real sense in which we could say, right, well, he said that, that there's nothing we do, it's, it's, it's not what we do, it's what Jesus has done. Okay, lads, we'll put our feet up and just trust the Lord. As some Christians believe that, and they do, that they, they, they become totally passive about the whole thing. Now, they remember what I said in the Philippians passage earlier. Paul says, work out your own salvation. Because there is something we can do. We must cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he works this out in our experience, i.e. we must work out what God has worked in. So there is something for us to do. It's not for us to put our feet up and be passive in any sense at all. We must work out this experience in our lives. It doesn't mean that we're doing it. No, we're simply allowing the Holy Spirit to do it. But we must very definitely do these things if we are to grow in this and come into an increasing experience of it. I mean, there are various things I could throw out. Prayer and praise. Um, confession of sin. Remember Romans 8.28, all things work together for good. You've got to apply that no matter what you're going through. But look at the things, and back to Ephesians 4 now, look at the things that Paul says here. Remember, we've had four and a half chapters of what Jesus has done, and all this, the, the moment you were born again, all this was true of you. Before you began to understand it, before you began to have an inkling of it, all this is true of you. That's fantastic. And after four and a half chapters of Paul saying, right, lads, this is what Jesus has done, this is the truth about you, he then goes on to tell them what they must do about it in order to work it out. Now, there's a lot of super spirituality going around today. And the super spiritual ones among you, if there are any, and I hope there are, are going to be desperately disappointed with this bit. Because it is so nitty-gritty, it's unbelievable. I mean, 
I mean, am I going to tell you to fast for 40 days? <laughs> Sorry, nothing so spiritual. Am I going to tell you that if you pray in tongues for three hours every day it'll work? No, let me tell you, you can pray for three hours every day and still be out of fellowship. No problem. What am I going to do? Well, what does Paul tell them? Right, okay. Verse 25. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbours. Now, can you see that having this grand sort of statement of what is true of us, Paul says, right, now we're going to work it out. And what we see is relationship. <coughs> Every day, ordinary relationships. I mean, it's amazing. That's not what we meant, Lord. I mean, surely we were seeking a commitment that was somewhat more spiritual than that. I know Christians who are. They're not interested in stuff like this. They want to grow in the Lord. They haven't got time for this sort of stuff. This is it. This is how we grow. This is how we work out our salvation, by living in obedience with these principles. So that wherever these verses judge us, and we realise, ah, yes, naught out of ten on that one, confess it, repent. Putting away all falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. You see, everything that has happened to you, this grand what Jesus has accomplished, is because you're one with him. Amen. Now then, my hand is one with me. It's a member of my body. If you cut it off, I'd be dismembered. Therefore, this is true of you because you're one with Jesus. But the thing is, I'm one with Jesus as well. Now, here we immediately get problems. Because if you're one with Jesus, and I'm one with Jesus, you and I are one. That hand is part of me. That hand is part of me. Can you see they're related in a very direct way? They are part of each other. So, therefore, you cannot in any way at all work out your oneness with Jesus except that you're working it out with your brothers and sisters because Paul says we are members one of another. You see, your salvation is individual but when you became one with Jesus you joined many, many other people who are one with Jesus and you are one with them. And we're going to see that if you like working out our experience of being one with Jesus is done by working out our experience of being one with each other. Can you see what I'm getting at? If being one with Jesus means that when I sin against him I must put that right. Being one with Jesus also means if you sin against me you must put that right with me, not just Jesus. And if I sin against you I must put that right with you and not Jesus. Can you see what I'm saying? Because if you and Jesus are one, and I and Jesus are one, we are one. Can you see what I'm getting at? And it's only as it's worked out in the context of day to day, the people we're in fellowship with, the people we live with. So speak the truth with your neighbour. Be honest in your relationships with each other. Be angry. Now, I don't want to home in on this first, because I think I did it a few weeks ago. Didn't I be angry, but sin not? I think we have done it here, not too long ago. But be angry, but do not sin. There is a correct anger. Get the tape if you want to, you know, find out the difference. But, he says, do not let the sun go down on your, on your anger. So, even if you're angry and it's justified, which it probably isn't, but even if it is, <laughs> is, your, is the sun... Not me, he says confidently. <laughs> Is the sun going down on your wrath? Even if you are justifiably angry, as I say, which probably isn't true anyway, but even if you are justifiably angry, are you lying in bed at night winning arguments with whoever it is you're angry with? I mean, have you ever done that? I've done that, laying in bed at night, you know, pretending these people are in the room and I'm winning the argument. In my mind, I've done it. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Husbands and wives, this is dead easy because she's lying just next to you. So, I mean, it's no problem, is it, to put that right with her? 
good advice, husbands and wives, isn't it? Don't, don't go to sleep. Don't let anything be between you at the end of the day. Anything you've done wrong, confess it to each other. Be right with each other about it. But again, not just husbands and wives, everyone in the body of Christ. He says, and he says, give no opportunity to the devil. Give no place to the devil. Because if we don't obey these things, then in actual fact, Satan and demons can get into us. They can actually get into a part of our lives. I mean, if you want to live in resentment, if you've got someone that you will not forgive, and you are commanded to forgive, I mean, if Jesus has forgiven us everything we've done wrong, how on earth can we hold something against someone else, no matter how bad it was? All right. I mean, I've had bad things done against me, but I realise that that's nothing compared with what I've done against Jesus. Can you see what I mean? But if you want to be in unforgiveness, if you want to have an area of your life where you're not going to be honest with Jesus about it and clear it up with him, then if it's resentment, don't be surprised if eventually you end up with a demon of resentment. A demon of resentment, you know, travelling around looking for somewhere. Ah, oh, that looks nice, he says. He sees that bit in you that's resentment personified. He thinks, ah, oh, I'll be very comfortable there. And he moves in. Can you see? And then on top of everything else, you've ended up demonised. Well, praise God, the minute you realise that, you can confess the sin and the demon can be booted out. But can you see? Give no place to the devil. All right. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may, may be able to give to those in need. You see how practical that is? Change the way you live. I mean... Amazing! It's so it's so straightforward. It's so pra it's annoying. Is it so practical? We wanted something more spiritual than this. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for edifying. Can you see? It's so nitty gritty. It's living right with Jesus every day and with your brother and sister. Now then, lo and behold, we've reached verse thirty, and look what it says. <laughs> And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is what grieving the Spirit means. When you refuse to live in the new nature, and when you live in the old nature, out of fellowship with Jesus, refusing to believe what Jesus has done, unwilling to implement it because of some silly grudge or sin that you've got, all right, that you're hanging on to, if you're doing that, then the Holy Spirit is grieved inside of you. Now that's why when you're out of fellowship, you're sad. Have you noticed that? I mean, we all know the brave attempts. I mean, we can all sing jolly choruses when we're out of fellowship, can't we? But inside, we're not happy. Have you noticed that? When you know you're out of fellowship, but you're going to show them you're not... You see, so you're praising the Lord and stuff like that. You know, don't you? There's no joy in you. You're sad inside of you. Why is it you've been born again, the Holy Spirit is one with your spirit, and the Holy Spirit is grieving inside of you? And if the Holy Spirit is grieving in your spirit, you're going to be sad. Whereas if the Holy Spirit is joyful in your spirit, you're going to be joyful. Can you see what I'm getting at? Now then, why is it that this grieves the Holy Spirit? Well, I'll tell you, there's only one thing that the Holy Spirit wants. Wants to glorify Jesus. So all the Holy Spirit wants. He is the backseat member of the Trinity. Very loath to show himself. When he did, it was a dove. You know, I mean, so we'd be action man, wouldn't we? <laughs> I mean, we, we want people to see the power and the glory. Here we come. The Holy Spirit, a dove. You know, I, I mean, sort of the slightest thing will, will scare a dove away. The, the shyness of the Holy Spirit. Because all he wants to do is to glorify Jesus. Now then, when you and I live in the new nature, when you and I live in submission to Jesus, allowing his death to neutralize our sin nature, then shall I tell you what happens? Jesus starts coming through you. And people see Jesus in you. And they say, isn't that lovely? 
I mean, they may hate Jesus, they may gnash his teeth, their teeth against him, some people do. But the point is, Jesus is being shown forth. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do, draw attention to Jesus. But if you live in your old nature, what happens? Jesus isn't seen. And that's what the Holy Spirit doesn't like, because he wants Jesus to be seen. Now that is why the Holy Spirit is grieved, and this is what it means. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you with all malice. Now again, these are day-to-day things, aren't they? They're day-to-day things that we must judge a lot more harshly than we do. You see, we can be soft on ourselves if we like. But if we are, we're just not going to experience what I'm talking about. We'll get to heaven. Of course we will. We're saved. But we won't get to heaven on a little bit of heaven. I mean, ignore these things if you like. Be soft on yourself. But you won't know the glory of the Lord down here. You will up there. But you won't down here. And the point is that if you don't, you're not bringing glory to Jesus. You see, and we ought to want to bring glory to Jesus. So we can soft pedal ourselves, if you want. But you see how silly that is, how much better it is to start saying, yeah, that in me is wrong, I'm going to stop being soft on myself. I'm going to go and make that apology. I'm going to stop being so silly. Lord, forgive me for for my criticism, forgive me for, for whatever it is, you see. So easy, confess it, and immediately the Lord has forgiven you. One of the lovely things in verse 30 is that when Paul says about not grieving the Holy Spirit, look at the thing he adds, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now why does he add that? He adds that to remind them that when you were born again, the Holy Spirit Amongst all the many other things that he did, he sealed you. Now, in the ancient world, a king had a seal, and it was usually on a ring. And it meant two things. First, it meant ownership. So that if, if a document was, was being sent somewhere, um, or if there was something that had the king's seal on it, it meant the king, who had ultimate power, owned that thing. And you kept your mitts off, unless you got permission. So it denoted ownership. But the other thing it meant was this, it meant security. That when the king sent a message somewhere, a scroll with his seal in wax and the impression of his ring stamped on it, anyone who opened that died and they knew. And it represented security. That could not be opened at all. It was safe because it had the king's seal on. And what Paul is saying here is that, look, He's emphasising that because you were born again, because the king owns you, you are secure, you're going to get where you're going. Nothing can, in any way, end up with you being lost. <laughs> All right. Now, he adds that in, in contrast to, um, I won't give any names, but a church that I preach at sometimes. And uh, the people there wanted me to do some teaching on eternal security. Well, the elders got a little bit edgy because there were some people in the church who they didn't think were doing very well. They didn't think they were following the law very closely. And they didn't want to encourage them in sin. And they thought that if, if I started teaching eternal security, that it would just encourage them to go into sin. I, they wanted to sort of hang at least something over their heads. I mean, if they're not going to be very good Christian, let, let's at least threaten them with eternal damnation. I, dreadful, isn't it? You see, well, I mean, here, Paul is emphasising, look, it's up to you. You can be a faithful Christian, or you can be an unfaithful Christian, but obviously, you're going to get there, you're going to be saved. There's no two ways about that. And that's lovely. I mean, holiness isn't hung over us as a threat. I mean, in the scripture, you don't find God saying, look, you, you know, I, either you do this or, or, or I'm, I'm going to send you into the lake of fire at the last. You know, there's nothing like this. We respond to Jesus because he loves us. Not because we think he's going to kick us out if he doesn't. Even if we don't respond to him. Can you see, this is a loving response to everything that the Lord has done for us. And he says, verse 32, be kind 
to one another. It's not just a question of what we've got to stop doing, it's what we've got to start doing. <laughs> Be tender-hearted and forgiving. Now look, we've got to do this. It may take an act of the will. You don't have to feel, feel forgiving against that person who's grieved you. But my goodness, you've got to forgive them. And when we start doing what the Word of God says, just because God says it and because that's good enough, all right, when we start doing that as an act of the will, then our feelings will start to get sorted out. But don't worry about the feelings. This is an act of the will. You may well have to be kind to someone through gritted teeth sometimes. You may have to. But the point is you've got to be kind to them. Can you see what I'm getting at? Go back into the Colossians, where we saw that parallel passage in Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 1, he says, If then you have been raised with Christ. That's exactly what we've said we have been. Verse 5, Put to death therefore what is earthly in you, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Verse 8, Put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, foul talk. Can you see? Put them away. And it's only when we really bring these things to the Lord, and confessing the Lord, not getting hung up, when you confess them and they don't go away overnight. That's not your problem. The Lord will take care of that. But we must be faithful in confession of our sins and putting things right. Can you see? That's what we do to work out what God has done in us. We must do that. It's vitally important. Now then, I said I'd sort of tell you just one or two nice things about one day when this body dies. All right. Because... When this body dies, then your problems are over. And your problems are over for this reason. You see, when you were born again, you were set free from the penalty of sin. You will never go to the lake of fire. You can rest about that. It never, ever, ever happened. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. All right? God is able to, com you know, to, to take charge of what you've committed unto him against that day. No problem, you'll get there. You're saved from the power of sin once and for all. Now, you're being sanctified, you're being set free from the power of sin in your life. And Jesus has done it all, it's up to you. Can you see? We will be as holy as we want to be. We won't be any more holy. We won't be any less holy, but we will be as holy as we want to be. Can you see? Everything we need is there. We've just got to be obedient to the Lord. And that's how we abide in Jesus. We're saying, yes, Lord, I'm free. Therefore, I'm going to act free. All right. Lord, I'm saved. I'm going to act saved. And I'm just going to trust you that when I do act saved, it's going to work. All right. And where you trip up, you bring that to the Lord, pick yourself up and start again. Totally positive. When you've sinned, confess it, it's gone. All right. So then, here and now, you're being set free from the power of sin. And that is up to you. All right. You can be faithful or unfaithful. That is up to you. But you see, the sinful nature is grounded in this body that you've got. The Bible calls it the body of death. And one day this body is going to die. Now when you die, which is what death is, when the body dies, you are then going to be set free, not from the penalty of sin, it's already been done, not from the power of sin, but you are then going to be set free from the presence of sin. Because when you die, then your old nature is dead and gone completely. And all you've got left is the you in the true glorious radiance of Jesus Christ himself. You see, the moment you die, you're free totally of sin. There's no more sin nature in you at all. And then at the rapture, when you get your new body, a resurrection body, as John says, then we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So you see the total comprehensiveness of what God has done for us set free from the penalty of sin, being set free from the power of sin, and one day you will be set free from the very presence of sin. And then you will be, and I say this carefully, it got misunderstood one place where I said it, but it is true, and I'm going to say it again. 
if, say I died, all right, now I mean, no one has got their new bodies yet. I mean, the people who have died, all the believers who've died, they're with the Lord in paradise in heaven, but they haven't got their new bodies yet. They get them at the rapture, all right? But just assume that I, I died now, all right, and that I went up to heaven and the Lord said, right, okay, I'm going to break a rule here. And I'm going to send. Old, I'm, I'm going to give BJ a resurrection body early, and I'm going to send him down to that church in in Derby. All right. Now, if I appeared in my resurrection body at a church in Derby, I tell you, they would fall on their knees and worship me, thinking I was Jesus. Can you see? That is the extent that we will share the nature of Jesus. Have you understood what I've said there? Because if Jesus is going to share his glory with us, which is exactly what he's going to do, if we shall be like him, if we shall see him as he is, can you see, if you were to appear now amongst us, as you are one day going to appear at the time when everyone gets their glorified bodies, can you see that anyone who didn't recognize you would think you were Jesus manifesting himself in his glorified body. Can you see what I'm saying? That is the extent of the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Absolutely revealed in us. And that's what it's all about. But here and now, it's up to us to what extent we work that out in practice. The glory of Jesus totally is going to be revealed in each one of us after we die or when we get our new bodies. But the extent to which the glory of Jesus is revealed in us here and now is up to us and according to our response and commitment and obedience to what Jesus says. And, um, you know, so in that sense, the responsibility is ours. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. For it is that God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now then, look. God is at work in you both to will, he's given you that desire. All right. Do you remember in Romans 7 when Paul's struggling, you know, he's looking back to his early years as a Christian when God's dealing with him. And he says, with my mind I can will to do what is right, but I can't do what's right. And he says something very interesting. He says, therefore, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. And you see, nothing wrong with you, it's your sin. It's your... Paul separates you, the new nature, from the sinful nature. It's your sinful nature that's the problem, not you. All right. So God is at work in you both to will. Well, we're okay with that, aren't we? We desire after holiness. Or I hope we do. If, if you don't, repent and start doing it. It's simple, no problem. All right. But our problem is working out in practice. But it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You see, the point is this, that when we respond in obedience and faith to Jesus, it's not going to be us who's doing it. It's going to be Jesus doing it through us. And that is why if you try and beat your sinfulness in the power of the flesh, it will beat you. All right, you cannot conquer your sin. But if you allow Jesus to conquer you, then you'll find yourself overcoming your sin nature. But it's not you that's doing it. Suddenly it's just being overcome because it's Jesus empowering you to do it. And I can look back over things in my own life where one has struggled and struggled and struggled and tried and tried and tried. Mm. And then somehow in it, God, he brings you to the point of such hopelessness and brokenness about it. It's almost that you give up, even. And then later on, you've hardly noticed it, but you look back and you think, it's gone. You hardly notice it because Jesus has done it. Now, having said that, I'm all too aware of other parts of me where Jesus is still working on that, where I'm not there yet. But, as Paul says, I press on to make it my own. But largely, it's up to us, and we've got to do what the Bible says in regards to this. We've got to put off the old, and we've got to put on the new. And to that extent, we'll see 
the Lord moving amongst us very much more powerfully. But remember that when we're talking about this, it's not deep teaching we need. I'm being sarcastic. You need teaching. But a lot of Christians are too busy searching the deep things of God. I mean, I've met Christians whose faith is so deep, no one can reach it. You know? <laughs> uh, it's true. All right. it's, it's not the deep things of God in that sense we need. It's not continuous minute. I mean, obviously there are times we need the ministry of the laying on of hands. But in regards to this, no amount of laying on of hands is, is going to help you one whit. It boils down to the sorry that has to be said. It boils down to that thing that you're not doing that you've got to start doing. It, it boils down to that forgiveness that eventually you've got to bestow on whoever it is who's hurt you. Mm. Think, be diverse, you know, boil down to submitting an honest tax return. Mm. It, it can boil down mm. to these things. Mm. And yet, my goodness, what a treasure you receive in simply working out those little things. So, so don't, don't be too spiritual. Be practical. Because all of Paul's letters, they end up on these very, very practical notes. Let me show you one other thing. Well, while, while we're on this, turn to Ephesians 5, 18. Because this is something that gets missed. It's, it's, it's so important. It's so important. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. All right? Now, I mean, yeah, to be baptized in the Spirit, that is dead right, dead right. Moving in the power of the gifts of the Spirit, dead right. But this verse, people, take it out of context and they preach sermons on being filled with the Spirit. Now, the mistake is that Paul is writing a sermon on the subject here of being filled with the Spirit. Now, if you go down to verse 21, he tells you what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Now then, does it say spend 20 minutes a day speaking in tongues? No. doesn't say that. Get to every healing service you can find? No, it doesn't say that. It says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. It then goes on, husbands, love your wives. It goes on, it says, children, obey your parents. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters, or that would be employees and employers. Now, can you see... This isn't what we've become accustomed to in the spirit-filled life, is it? But when Paul decides to write specifically about what it means, having been baptised in the spirit, to go on being filled with the spirit, because in the Greek, that's what it says, do not get drunk with wine, but be being filled with the spirit, to give it its literal translation, be being filled. Go on being filled with the Spirit. How do you go on being filled with the Spirit? I mean, yeah, moving in the gifts and the rest, of course, but on top of that, the nitty-gritty living out at home of your Christian life. Do you remember when Jesus said about the uh, early church being baptised in the Spirit, he said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. They had to start in Jerusalem before they went on to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the, of, of the world. And you see, the problem with starting in Jerusalem is that that's where they've blown it. And unless you start where you've blown it, it doesn't mean anything. You know, I mean, you can't launch out to the ends of the earth until you've proved the Lord where you've blown it, i.e. where you are. Anyone can be spiritual outside. What are they like to live with? That's the nitty-gritty of the whole thing.